Yeah, welcome to week seven. We're almost done with the whole class now. There's three more lectures. And the last two lectures are actually not even like Android programming related because the last lecture is going to be, um, you know, non-Android things that we, or like things that we haven't really talked about. And the last lecture is the, uh, the kind of panel discussion. So let me just show you the map one more time where we are. So right now we're in week seven. Uh, like I mentioned, week nine over here is going to be basically all the things we haven't talked about. So there's actually not going to be too much code in that lecture. It's going to be primarily things like React Native or Flutter or frag, like more advanced uh, concepts in Android. And the last lecture is going to be an industry panel. But yeah, now that we're in week seven, all of you are done with two out of the three projects in the class. The third assignment is Yelp clone. It's now live, so you should be able to see it in Canvas. And the idea of the assignment, like the name implies, is that it'll be a clone of Yelp, like a very simple um, clone of, of the Yelp restaurant review app. So it'll give you practice with Retrofit, which is a networking library, and there's a ton of extension possibilities. So if you actually look at the, the project handout, the amount of video walkthrough time is actually quite small. It's actually the smallest out of all the three projects. So from that perspective, the required part, I'm hoping all of you will be able to get done pretty quickly. Um, but I'd really love to see people go deep in the extensions. All right, so I wanted to also spend a minute just doing a recap of the mid quarter survey. So I think there was like 12 people who replied. So I appreciate if you spent the time to do that. Um, this is the most telling part of the, of the survey in my opinion. I basically was asking people each of the different components of the class, um, like what did you think of it? And so lecture, um, I think overall people find it valuable. The most valuable parts I think of the class as per the student's perspective is the walkthrough videos and the extension ideas, which makes sense because that's kind of critical to how each of you are doing the assignment. And the part that the, I think could use improvement is the assignment peer feedback. So like most people rated peer feedback as somewhat useful. And then, you know, a couple people rated it as like not useful. And so if I went, if I go through each of these, I think lecture people are doing pretty well. Um, assignment walkthrough videos and the extension ideas, people are, are really finding value in those, but people are not finding that much value from the peer feedback. And so in my head, the peer feedback is basically tightly linked to code review. And so what I'm hearing when people say that, you know, they're not getting that much out of the peer feedback, it's that boils down to, I'm not able to meaningfully review people's code. And so I think there are some really valid reasons for that. Um, which are not the fault of the students and more a problem with how I set up the class and that's okay. But I wanted to just take a step back and I wanna just get your, all of your opinions. Um, what is the value of code review? So anyone can just shout it out. Like why, why do people, why do most companies in Silicon Valley have a code review process? Yes, I love it. I love it. So I think there's, I have like three or four bullet points. Let me, I think both the two or three that you mentioned, Kevin, I think are great. The first one I heard you say is, are there logic errors? So basically catching bugs. So maybe the author of the code, they didn't consider all the edge cases. So as a reviewer, I could point that out and say, hey, I think you're not handling this properly. The other thing that you mentioned is um, like style. Um, is the code written idiomatically? So it follows best practices for the language. So in this class, Kotlin, and I think this is a great opportunity because I think most people in the class are new to Kotlin. And so there is a ton of opportunity here to just learn more about, you know, what is the kind of the standard way to write Kotlin. Um, and, and that might also depend on the company, right? Like the idiomatic way to write Kotlin code at Facebook may be different from how do you write Kotlin code at, you know, Pinterest or another company, right? So that there is some actually amount of, there's no right answer. So you might be a really, really smart engineer, but just because you joined an organization, there might still be valid feedback on your code because you're not really familiar with that company. Um, I think there's also one thing, I think you're kind of hinting at this as well, Kevin, but there's one more aspect, which is, um, are there other approaches to implementing the same functionality? So oftentimes, you know, you're writing a, you're writing a code review, you're writing code, you're writing a diff is, is how we call it at Facebook. You you write a diff in order to achieve some outcome. Um, and that might take you like, you know, 500 lines of code or whatever. But to achieve the same outcome, if you approach it in a different way, you might achieve the same functionality. And so like, 
as a code reviewer, it would be my job to say, hey, I think you're making this too complicated. Or if you're, if you leverage this library that this other team has invented or created, this, all of this code would be unnecessary. And that's almost always a, a better thing, right? You don't want to reinvent the wheel. So that's another huge benefit. Um, and I think the other thing that I think was mentioned is around, you know, knowledge sharing. And I think that's also a critical part of it. Is that, you know, when you're working on a production software project, then people are going to take time off for a week or two or however long. They might quit the company. And so you want to make sure that there's no part of the code base where only one person is familiar with how it works. There's something called the bus factor, right? I don't know if people have heard of this term called the bus factor, but basically means um, like <laughs> if someone on your team gets hit by a bus, then... Um, is your team resilient enough to still be able to make progress in the code that, you know, that person was owning? Like if you have one person who knows everything about the code and your team would be totally lost without him or her, that's a bad sign. And so code review is a really valuable way to share knowledge and make sure that you don't end up in that situation. And I want to mention now why hit by a bus. I, that's a good question. <laughs> Does anyone know the history? I just, I'm not sure why it's called the bus factor, but basically like, the kind of the history or the legend is like, you know, what if you're walking down the street and you get hit by a bus and how would your team be able to survive you not being around anymore? So I'm not really sure why bus versus a car versus, you know, COVID-19. Um, but, you know, I think just, that's the, the standard. Um, there's one other really important aspect of this, which I think, honestly, like I think catching bugs in code review is not the most important job of code review. The most important job in my mind is actually socialization and team, uh, company and team socialization. So code review is a really, really valuable way to feel as, a, as if you're part of the team. And it's almost like a cultural thing where most companies will have some sort of like fun, like you might leave a, a sticker or a, a GIF on the code review to say, hey, I, I love what you did here. I think this is really creative. Um, and so it's kind of part, it's a core part of most engineering teams culture. And that's actually really what I wanted to try and do with this class. And I think it's not going so well. Um, my purpose was number one, I think like all the things we mentioned, which is like, can you catch bugs? Can you comment on people's, um, Kotlin code? Like if there's something they could do a little bit more idiomatically, but I think the other part is I actually wanted to create a community, which in the sense that. This is a one unit class and we don't have that much interaction between students. I thought this is a really nice way for one student to be able to offer some constructive feedback or, you know, give praise to another student. Um, and it's kind of a nice culture building or social building activity. So if I look back at, you know, the, the class structure, the reason why I think it's not so effective is because 90% of the code that all of you are submitting is largely the same, right? And that makes sense because you're going through this walkthrough video. So it turns out that this code review is not actually super effective because you're only really commenting on the 10% of code um, or, you know, depends on how much extensions you've done. But given that most people are doing only a couple of extensions, there's not that much meaningful feedback to give in code review. So I think that's one thing that um, is a little bit tough. And the other aspect is that, you know, most people here are new to Kotlin. So it's not like I can, most students will have the know-how or the background to say, hey, you're doing this, you know, delete functionality in the mind maps. And there's a library which will do this for you. Like, it, it may not be clear um, that people can suggest that. So I feel like uh, that's one, one other issue. And so I have a plan to address this. Um, so first off, I'm going to just go through a five minute example of some quick ways that of how I would do a code review. Um, and the second thing that I want to do is I'm going to change, change it up a little bit for the Yelp clone assignment. So for the Yelp clone assignment, instead of each person doing one code review, you are now going to do two code reviews. <laughs> so it sounds like a very backward solution because it's not going well. I'm going to ask you to do more of it, but here's my um, my, my idea is that part of the reason why the code review is not going super hot right now is that you can, you only get to have one person to review. You only get to have one project to review the code of, right? So my idea is that in the next assignment, I'm going to pair you up with two people. So now when you have two projects to look at, you can compare 
what did person A do and what did person B do? And look at, compare those two and compare it with your own project. And that will hopefully allow you to give more meaningful feedback. So you know that expression, like the beatings will continue until the morale improves. <laughs> So it, it, it's not that bad, but basically like, I know you guys hate, I mean, you don't hate, but you know, it sounds like code is not going well. I'm going to ask you to do more of it. And I think the more of it you do, then I think you'll actually get more value out of it. So that's what um, I would like to do for the Yelp clone. Um, if you have a strong objection to this, email me or come talk to me and then I might amend it. But otherwise we're going to do two code reviews for Yelp clone. Thoughts? Okay, cool. So in that case, let me just quickly now um, show you, here's the code that we wrote from last time. Um, I wanna do a quick example of code review here. Um, so do y'all remember this? We have a recycler contacts. And the thing that we added last week was the ability to go to a new activity. You can enter in someone's name, let's say Emily, right? And Emily, let's make you 80 years old. So we hit save and then Emily shows up right here in the position number five. So hypothetically, someone submitted this project and then we wanna give feedback to, to, the, to the author. So let me do a quick um, reminder of how this works. How come I can't zoom in? Hopefully, I, I'm having a hard time zooming in on the font here. Hopefully you can see it okay. Um, okay, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is when you, launch a new activity and you want to get data back from it, we call this method start activity for result. And we pass in a request code. And in the on activity result method, which is what gets triggered when the child activity finishes itself, we have another, we check that same request code. So the first, if I was doing this as a hypothetical um, code review, the first thing I would say is, hey, let's make this into a constant. It doesn't need to be like this magic number floating here and here. Um, I'd like to make that a constant so I can just change it once rather than twice in the future if I need to change it. So that's the first thing I would do. I would say, hey, let's let's put this in to private const val request code. So it's 89. And then I would just pass in that constant here. Okay, that, that's that first one. And that's, the second one is... Um, idiomatic call-in, right? So this is, this is a very contrived example. I basically added a line here where I'm printing out, we make a list of contacts and I say the, the last contact in the list is, and then we have this concatenation with the plus sign and then we're printing out the last element of contact list. So can someone just tell me how might we make this more idiomatic? How, how, how might we make this more standard call-in code? Thoughts? Isn't there a way to access the last index of a list? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So we, I think we might have talked about this in one of the earlier lectures. I think um, that's what you're referring to, which I love that. You don't need any of this kind of complexity. You just need to say contact list dot last. And that will actually retrieve the very last element. So that's one really great way of making this more idiomatic call and code. There's one more thing is that in general, when you want to do this kind of string concatenation, there's an easier way to do that, which is by using this dollar sign symbol. And that's a much more standard way and more powerful way of doing string interpolation. So that's the other comment I would make here is that this is, this is generally going to be a better way of printing out that last element. And then finally, variable naming. Um, this is another big topic in programming, like you want to make it very clear what is the purpose of each variable. Okay, so actually, I don't have too many comments about that in this project. But I do have a comment about the how are we naming the variables, right? I think context list and context adapter, both of these are named appropriately, like they actually fulfill, um, like, like when I read the uh, variable name, it's clear what the purpose is. But I do have a issue or like a comment about the the like the prefix on the variable. So can someone look at these and just tell me how might you improve that? Looking at the names of the variables. 
right? So we have contacts list, right? And then we have M contacts adapter. So how might we make that a little bit better? So first off is the visibility modifier of these variables, right? So probably what you should do is make it explicit that right now, if you don't have a visibility modifier, these are package visible, which means that if there's another class here, then they could actually access these variables. And so you don't really want that. You want to minimize the scope or the visibility as much as possible. So I would probably just make both of these private. So that's one thing. The other thing, which I think is really important, is the inconsistency of the naming. So typically, if you have a member variable, which means that there's one of these created per instance of this class being created, you want that to, like, for example, I could say, like, private um, var num contacts, right? This, this might be an integer. And I could set it equal to, like, zero initially, right? And so you want the naming of these variables to be consistent. And so right now, what Kevin pointed out is that one of these variables has an M in front of it. That's called Hungarian notation, right? When you prefix something with an M to indicate a member variable, or you prefix something with an S to indicate that it's a static variable. In Kotlin, you typically don't want that. But if I were doing a code review and someone had all the different variables here prefixed with M, I would be okay with that because it's consistent. The thing that bothers me here is that they have one variable which is not prefixed with M and the other which is prefixed with M. And that doesn't really make sense, right? In terms of the style, it just pick one or the other and be consistent with it. So really what I would do if I was trying to make this kind of more um, standard Kotlin is I would rename context adapter to just be, you know, without the M like that. And now I'd be pretty happy with this code. All right, any questions on that? That's basically all I wanted to say about code review and the change which is going to happen for um, assignment number three. Good. Okay, so the next topic is activity lifecycle. And the key idea here, I don't want to spend too, too long on this actually because it's not super relevant to project number three. And even in the real world, you typically don't worry too much about this, but you should have an awareness of it. This is a very common interview question. So the idea here is that the activity, which is you know where all your business logic lives, your Android activity can be in any number of, of states, resumed, paused, stopped, or destroyed. Those are the four states that you should be aware of. So what resumed means is that the activity is in the foreground. So when you actually open up an application on your phone, typically when you're interacting with it, that'll be in the resumed state. Paused means that the activity is partially obscured by another activity. The activity cannot receive user input or execute code. So like one common use case for paused is a lot of more recent Android phones will have split screen where you have like, you know, your texting app on the bottom half of your screen and another application on the top half. Then in that scenario, one of the activities that's shown could be in the paused state. Stopped means that the activity is hidden or in the background. Um, and at this point, member variables are maintained. So um, for example, if I hit the home button on my Android app, on, on my Android phone, then my activity will be backgrounded and I'll just be looking at my home screen, but the activity is not destroyed yet. It's still there in memory, but it hasn't been destroyed. And so destroyed is the most extreme version, which is basically all the resources for the activity are reclaimed by the Android system. So if I hit the back button multiple times, or if I go into the activity manager, and I swipe up, that will destroy the activity. Okay, so let me show you that. If I go back here and I go to that, if I go to the activity launcher and I swipe up like that, that will actually kill the activity. So the on activity destroyed, um, on destroyed callback will get triggered, which will tell the Android, the Android system basically telling us that this activity no longer is in memory. On the other hand, if I, Oops. So on the other hand, if I hit, hit, hit the home button, that will cause me to go back to the home screen, but my activity hasn't been destroyed yet. So based on like what operation the user does, you might send the activity to a different life cycle. That's the key thing that you should know. And the Android system will tell you when the state tra transition happens. So here is the magic diagram that 
um, if you want to go out and, and interview for an Android job, you should have this image ingrained in your memory because it's super common to for people to ask you about, you know, like when will this, when when should you clean up memory or when should you do a certain action based on this life cycle, right? So what happens typically is when the activity is launched, the on create method will get called, then on start and then on resume. And there's a corresponding life cycle method on the other side. So as the activity is going to be destroyed, you have an on pause, which basically is the reverse of on resume. On stop, which is the reverse or like the mirror event for on start. And then on destroy, which is the analogy to on create. So these methods are called by the Android system. You don't, you don't ever invoke these methods. They're called for you by the Android system. And they inform you as a developer that, hey, your activity is now going into a different state. So you might want to do something about that. So let me just quickly, I want to um, spend just a couple more minutes on this topic. Now, hopefully, you can see how this all fits together. Like we just on create method from the very beginning, right? Like the very first um, lecture, I showed you how we have a new project and the method that gets overridden by default is on create. And now you know a little bit more about why is it called on create. This is a life cycle method. And the inner system is telling us that, hey, your activity is now being created. So we're going to be in the created state. So let me show you a couple more. So I could say on start. And what this is saying is that I want to get notified through overriding this method on start that my, now my activity is on start. So I'm going to put a log statement here. On start, and actually, let me do something similar for on create. On create, right? And then what was the next one? Um, it's on resume. Are they not? Yeah, on resume. Okay, so now once these three have these three events have happened on create, on start, on resume. Now let's put in the life cycle methods for the reverse side, which is when our activity is being destroyed. So I'll say um, on pause, on stop, and on destroy. I'll say on pause. All right, so is everyone, give me like a thumbs up if you're kind of following along with what's happening here. All I'm doing is I'm telling the inner system, I want to be notified when these things are happening. And when they happen, I'm simply putting a log statement. And I want to now run the application with you so we can see when do these uh, different log statements appear. And that will be like a very instructive way for us to see what's happening. Cool, I see one thumbs up. Thank you, Han. Okay, so I'm gonna, let me run the app and let's actually see what's happening. Okay. So all of these are happening inside of the main activity. So I'm gonna filter for logs um, in the main activity. Where is my, try this again. RV practice. All right, so here, let's see what, I just hit the, app launcher icon. And the first callback we get is on create. And then we get this method, this line that I added from before, which is <clears throat> the last contact in the list. Then we have on start and on resume, right? So that actually makes sense. So the order of these makes a lot of sense. Um, now, let's say that I go to the home screen. So now we got the on pause and on stop triggered, but notice that we haven't gotten the on destroy triggered yet. And that makes sense because I actually haven't if I go into the task switcher, you can see that the activity is still there in the background. It's just not running right now. So it hasn't been destroyed, but it's in the background. So if I click on it from the task switcher one more time, now I get on start and on resume. 
That makes sense because we don't need to create the activity again. So all of the logic here, it will not run again. The only logic that will run again are the ones in these two methods. And so now if I properly destroy this activity, the way I'll do that, I'll go into the task switcher and then swipe up. So then now I got on pause, on stop, and on destroy. Well, so it kind of all fits together nicely. So as an app developer, as an Android app developer, why do you care? The reason you care about the activity life cycle in Android is because you need to know when these methods are being triggered in order to take the proper action. For example, let's say that you're building a banking app where you want the user to enter in a pin code every time they open up the app, right? Kind of for security purposes. And so in that scenario, when I have the banking app open and I go to the home screen and I open up the app again, I would like to block any of the UI for my application until they enter in the pin. So the proper life cycle method at which point I should put this pin code UI would be an on resume, right? I wouldn't put it in on create because it's possible to background the app and open it up again without the on create method ever getting triggered. So if I want some code to be triggered every time the app comes back from the background, I would need to put it in on start. So that's the kind of knowledge you need to have in order to make sure you're um, implementing features properly. Or another example is, let's say you have a video player or like an audio player in your app. So you want to make sure you're make sure that you're releasing the resources for your audio player or video player at the right time um, when the app is being destroyed or paused or stopped, right? So depending on where you want to free the memory, you want to do that in the proper place. So what questions do you have about activity life cycle? Yeah, Anya is asking, could you demonstrate just on pause? So let me see how to do that. So if the question is like, when would be a scenario when on pause is triggered and not on stop, I think that would happen in kind of more rare circumstances. Like the one that I can think of is if you have split screen um, or another scenario is sometimes you can have one activity and you have you launch another activity, which is translucent. If that activity that you're launching is translucent, so you can see underneath it, then the parent activity would be in the on pause state, but it wouldn't be an on stop. So does that kind of make sense? Like, it, you know, everything I showed you here, let me try it one more time. If I go to the RV, Recycler view practice app. So here, if I hit the home button, we always see on pause and on stop together. And there are a couple of rare scenarios where on pause is triggered, but not on stop. So those are, I, I don't actually, I don't wanna um, demonstrate that just cause I think it'll take me a little bit longer to set up and show you that. But there are a couple of scenarios where you might only get on pause triggered. Does that kind of answer the question on you? Great. And then another question is EK is asking, what would happen if you drag down the screen? That is a wonderful question. I actually, let's check, let's find out together. So I'm, I'm on here. Um, right now the app is running. It's in the active state because I got the on resume callback. And you're asking well, if, we, if we drag down, what happens? Yeah, so this actually, the activity doesn't even go into on pause. I think it's still running in the foreground um, because like the elevation or like the, surface of the notification bar is is higher. So like there's no change in the in the life cycle for the activity. Yeah, it, that would have been interesting if that caused the on pause to get triggered because it is kind of translucent. Um, but I think that at that point we're still running like normal. All right, next topic is um, permissions. How much time do we have left? Yeah, 4.37, cool. Um, so what, what are permissions? Permissions on Android are really fundamental because they allow your app to access certain information. And the idea why we have permissions is because we wanna protect the user's privacy. So if, if I'm, a, if I'm a, a normal consumer and I try to download an app which fulfills a purpose, like I, I wanna download a flashlight app, I wanna have some guarantee that that flashlight app will not be able to detect my location in the world or, you know, be able to read all my contacts. So permissions are a guaranteed way that unless I explicitly grant permission, I know that that app won't do anything malicious. 
So there's a list of permissions that you can read from Android documentation. I, I'm not going to click in there, but there's a dozens of permissions. And similar to how we talked about with Android views, there's a, literally hundreds of different permissions in Android. You probably will only end up using less than eight or nine. There's a very common set of permissions and the rest you'll almost never worry about. But what, what you should know is that there are two kinds of permissions, one which is normal and the other is dangerous. So normal permissions are automatically granted to your app. So what, what's an example of a normal permission that we've already used in the class a couple times? Anyone? Internet, right? So all, every, every time we make a request to the internet to fetch data, like we did that for when we were doing image downloading, I think two weeks ago, we used the Picasso library to download an image from the internet. Internet is a normal permission, which means that we don't need to show a dialogue to the user asking them to grant permission for internet. On the other hand, you have dangerous permissions, and those are things which must be accepted by the user. For example, being able to get my location is a dangerous permission. Being able to read all the contacts on my phone, that's a dangerous permission. And for things like that, um, you need to explicitly get the permission of the user. And how do we do that? Let's talk about that next. The way you do that changed in Android 6.0. So in Android 6.0, which came out in 2015, um, Android 6.0 is called Android Marshmallow. There was a huge change in how do we grant permissions in the Android world. So prior to 6.0, it was granted at install time. And then after that, so for most phones nowadays, like if you have a phone which is relatively modern in the last five years, then the permissions are granted at runtime when needed. So does everyone kind of know the distinction between install time and runtime? So going back to the flashlight example, right? If I, if I, I'm like a, I'm a normal, you know, I'm just trying to figure out how to download a flashlight app on my phone. So the issue that was happening is in 2014, I would go to the Play Store and I would try and download a flashlight app and it would have all this like arbitrary, um, all these arbitrary permissions. And in order to, get the functionality to get a flashlight app on my phone, I had to, at install time, accept all the permissions. So if that flashlight app said, hey, I want to be able to look at your contacts, I want to be able to access the camera on your phone, and so on, as a user, I would be confused. Okay, why does the flashlight need all that stuff? But I don't really care because I just want to get the flashlight. And I would just go ahead and blindly accept all the permission dialogues. And that's kind of a bad thing, right? You want the user to know why these permissions are being requested. So starting in 2015, permissions are granted at runtime, which means that when you install the Flashlight app, the only permission, it actually, it won't request any permissions um, until you have downloaded it and opened up the app. And when you open up the app, when you tap on the certain component, which requires that permission, only then do you get this dialogue, like the one that you're seeing on the right side over here, to ask if the user um, is okay with that. And that gives me as a user much more confidence that I don't need to blindly grant all the permissions. I can do it on a per permission basis. So the way you request a permission in Android is you add it into the Android manifest file, right? So we, we had done this a couple of weeks ago. So we have this users permission tag and you add in the name of the permission. So here we're requesting the internet permission, which is not dangerous. So, um, because we are going to be requesting contacts at, run, at runtime instead of install time, you now have to write additional code in your app if you're trying to request a dangerous permission. So the internet is something which is normal. So you don't need any of this code for the internet. However, if I'm trying to read someone's contacts, which is what we're doing here, then there's a little bit of code that you need to write in order to check if that permission has been granted. And so that's what I wanna go, go through in this slide. So the first thing we do is we have this context compat method and it's called check self permission. And that will return to us a constant which we're comparing against this one, package manager permission granted. If the answer is no, that means the user has not granted the permission, right? If the answer is yes, we go into the else block. And then at that point, you can actually make the call into the contacts database, the content provider in order to read all of the contacts from that user. So then, then you're kind of done. If, if you go into the if statement, that means the permission is not granted. And so what you need to do here is 
if the user has previously requested this permission but denied the request, then there's an option here to show a rationale. Okay, so the Android system has built up this functionality called activity compat dot show should show request permission rationale. And the idea here is that if this returns true, then you have one more dialogue to explain why do you want to read the person's contacts. So the very first time that I request the contacts, this will typically return false. But if I request the contacts and then reject the permission and then request again, then this will return true. That's what this is for. But in the happy path where I've requested it for the first time, then you say no explanation is needed. We can go ahead and request the permission. And so that, that's through this request permissions um, method, static method on activity compat. And that will trigger um, a dialogue to pop up, a system dialogue to pop up saying, hey, this app is requesting a permission. And then you handle the result of that in a callback called on request permissions result. So you know how when we triggered a child activity to show up, we had the uh, launch activity for result, like, like, like this thing. Let me show you. Here, start activity for result. We got a callback on the activity, on activity result. Whenever that child activity finished, we would trigger this method and all this, this code would run. So similarly here, you would call this, um, you would call this method request permissions with the request read contacts, and then you'll get back on request permissions result. And that would be something else that you, you now need to override on request permissions result, right? And then you would also similarly check the request code that you asked for the permission with is the same as what you get back here. And then you also get back the result that the user accept or reject. That's the grant results. Okay. So actually, I don't want to go through an example here because um, it's not going to be relevant for the third project that all of you are going to do. But I just wanted you to have this on a slide so you're aware of it. So what questions do you have about permissions on Android? Okay. So I'm actually very happy. I feel like I'm usually always running out of time. Um, but I think we actually have enough time to properly get through networking API section before the end of class today. Any questions before we move on to the last topic? No? Okay. So networking and APIs is the topic for project number three. Like that's the main thing that I want you to get an understanding of. And this is fundamental to every Android app, like any almost every interesting Android app is going to talk to the internet. And that's what networking is. So you're going to be using the internet to retrieve data if you're talking to some API. Or if you, for example, are using like Twitter and you compose a tweet and send it, you're sending data over an API to Twitter's backend. And then Twitter is publishing it um, you know, on everyone else's timeline, right? And so your application needs to know where to get data and how to use it. Um, and that's what I want to talk more about. The main thing I want you to keep in mind as we talk about networking and, and dealing with the internet is that you don't want to make any network request on the main thread, otherwise known as the UI thread. So I don't know if we, we haven't really talked too much about this in the class, but Android apps are multi-threaded, right? So what that means is that your phone is powerful enough where it can actually have multiple threads running in, the, in a process. So your Android app will be running as a single process. There's one process dedicated to your app. Within that process, you can have many threads. And um, the, the key thing here is that all of the UI interaction happens on one special thread called the main thread or the UI thread. So the main thread and UI thread, you can kind of use interchangeably. And so the consequence of that is anytime you're doing something which is an expensive operation, you, you cannot do that on the main thread. And I say cannot deliberately because if the Android system detects that you're doing an operation which is too expensive on the main thread, it will actually kill your app for you. So there's actually a very strong um, possibility that your app won't even survive um, if you're doing anything expensive on the main thread. And the reason for this is because the main thread or UI thread is the thread that's responsible for trying to draw your app at 60 times per second. The refresh rate of most phones these days is 60 hertz. So 60 times a second, we're gonna try and redraw your whole application. And so if you have any operation occurring, which takes longer than around 20 milliseconds, which is the amount of time that you have 
to draw one, uh, one frame for your application that will result in jank. So jank is a term uh, which is basically referring to any kind of UI slowness or jittery behavior in your UI. And so the key thing is if you're doing expensive work, you can do that, but you have to delegate that to another thread and get a callback on the main thread saying, hey, that expensive work has concluded. And so how does that relate to networking? The networking is a prime example of an expensive operation. I'm just curious. So networking is a expensive operation. Can someone tell me other examples of an expensive operation that you don't want to do on the main thread? There are, two, there are two categories of expensive operations. Um, there might be more too, but two that I generally think about. One is IO bound and the other is CPU bound. And Kevin talked about both. So IO bound means any kind, anytime you're doing an input output as intensive operation, that is typically going to be something you don't want happening on the main thread. And networking is a good example of this, right? When you're making a API request for the Twitter API or the Yelp API, like we'll be doing in this in project number three, we're waiting on, um, the Yelp API to send data back. That is IO. So you can't have that happen on the UI thread. Similarly, if I'm making a call to a database, I have a SQLite database in my app, I'm making a request to it to say, I want to fetch all the contacts, that is IO bound. So you also, you cannot have that happen on the main thread. The other category is CPU bound. And so like Kevin mentioned, if I'm, for example, computing something uh, very intense, like something with graphics or like a, a contrived example, it's, let's say you want to calculate the, you know, the a prime number which has 500 digits. So there's actually a helper function in column which allows you to do this. And, if, and that's a super expensive operation. Like you're gonna have to go through a lot of um, CPU cycles. That is something you don't wanna happen on the main thread either. You wanna delegate that work to another background thread. And when that, when that finishes up, then you wanna notify the result of that on the main thread. So knowing which operations that your app is doing whether the CPU bound or IO bound is super important to making your app performant. So talking more about networking, which is primarily how most apps will be doing, um, you know, the IO, like IO intensive operations. There's some terminology that I think some of you might be familiar, some of you might not be. So I just wanna make sure that we're all on the same page. The client refers to the mobile app. So the app that you're building is a client. And typically it will make a query to a URL, right? So like for example, in project number three, um, you're going to have a URL which represents the API of Yelp, it'll be like api.yelp.com slash v3 slash businesses. So there'll be a particular query on the Yelp API. And when you issue that query, that'll go over the internet to some server. Right. And so the Yelp, um, like basically Yelp is going to have a bunch of servers living in the cloud somewhere and they'll be listening. They're constantly listening for requests and it'll service that request. That's why it's called a server, right? It'll service the request from our client and they'll say, Hey, this client is requesting data about, um, you know, restaurants which serve avocado toast in New York. So it'll do a query in the, in the database or however it finds out that information and give us back information. Um, to the client, right? So that, that process of communication between the client and the server, that is called an API. Like that language of communication is defined through an API, an application programming interface. So one of the questions is, um, how might we standardize how data gets transferred, right? So you have um, like, you could imagine you would have your own custom format for sending data back and forth, right? So for example, Yelp, the people at Yelp, the engineers at Yelp could decide that, okay, we're gonna basically have all the restaurants that the client is querying for, we're gonna send them in a comma separated list. And then below that, we're gonna have another line which has the rating, the star rating for every restaurant. And below that, the number of reviews for each of these restaurants and so on, right? And it could be some custom defined format that now on the client, we can parse that. It's just not that hard to parse a, a comma separated file and then read that into our own kind of data model, right? But that's actually a lot of custom work just for talking with Yelp. And so 
the smart people of the internet decided that let's standardize all the communication between all these different APIs. Let's figure out a common language. And that common language turns out primarily to be JSON. So JSON is JavaScript object notation. Um, and the idea is that the Yelp API, similar to the Twitter API, similar to the Flickr API, similar to pretty much every other API out there, is going to send data back and forth with JSON. And almost every programming language will have a way to read and write JSON data. So Kotlin has one, Java, JavaScript, Python, all these different languages are have really um, quick ways to read JSON data. And this makes our life as app developer much, much easier because now we have the ability to communicate across all of these different APIs. And so just some historical context, XML and HTML, are you can kind of think about them in a similar way. XML um, is what we use for defining the UI for our internet application, but you can also use XML as a way to transport data over the internet. And actually that was pretty common maybe 20 years ago. Recently, it's fallen out of favor and I think JSON is more popular. And HTML is also there, right? Like HTML is the way you define the markup of a web page. So you have an image tag here, I have a paragraph tag here, I have a div over here. That is another way to transfer data, right? So like all of these are examples of the same thing, which is a common language that all clients will know how to deal with. So the, the client in the case of HTML is a browser. So the browser will typically know when I get HTML, how do I render it? All right, so let me show you one quick example of a request. So here is the movie database API. So actually, let me go to the URL really fast. This is a nonprofit organization called TMDB, the movie database. And they basically have a public API, which allows you to query for common popular TV shows, um, movies, and you can, you can break it down by like rating or category and whatnot. And so they have an API, which is typically api.themoviedb.org. And you can see, okay, the, the endpoint that I'm targeting is movie slash now playing. And then you have an API key, which basically is a way to guarantee that, you know, you're authorized to make this request. So here you can see, okay, there's some JSON data, which has information like a title, a voting average, a, an ID of the movie, the poster path, and so on, right? So this is, a, this is what we'll be doing in our mobile application. We'll be making a request to this URL. We'll get data back, and then we'll parse out this data and turn it into data structures that we can then use to render in a recycler view or any kind of uh, widget on our Android app. So let's talk about the Yelp app. And this is actually a slide that I took from the video walkthrough. Um, your client is the phone, your mobile app is the client and you're gonna make a request to the Yelp server and you're gonna say, I want to search for all restaurants in New York that serve avocado toast. And then Yelp will do its magic based on whatever data it has and it'll return back to us a list of businesses and all these businesses will be similar to what we just saw. It'll be a list of JSON data. So getting down to the practical um, aspect of this, how do you make a network request on Android? And the answer, like many things in Android, is that there's no easy inbuilt way to do this. Like the Android system doesn't come with an easy, simple way to do this. So almost every Android app out there is going to use a library for networking. They're not gonna reinvent the wheel and try and invent the networking solution based on the primitives. They're gonna use a library. There's a cu couple of very, very common libraries. Async HTTP client is pretty common. Retrofit is probably the most common. And that's retrofit is the one that we're, we're going to be using in the Yelp clone. So that's what I would like each of you to get practice with. Volley is also a library that was developed by Google actually to do networking. Um, but it's a little bit lower level. So it's, I think a bit more complicated. Um, it's not as popular. And then Ion is another one. There's probably like five or 10 more networking libraries. Um, so depending on your use case, you might have to explore others and then choose something else. So for the last 10 minutes, I just wanna do a really quick example with you. <clears throat> and I wanna show you how to use this library, async HTTP library. 
if I, I have the guide open right here. So the reason I wanted to pick this one, async HTTP client, is because CodePath developed this library, so I'm pretty familiar with it. So the way you typically want to um, integrate this library is the first thing is you need to add a dependency. So I'm going to add this line into the build.gradle. Um, go into the build.gradle and then add this in. And tap on sync now. So what that's doing is this library is referring to some sort of like source code that lives somewhere, right? And when I add this line, I tap on sync now, we're taking all that source code and including it into our project. So now we can actually start to reference the files in that library. And using this library is actually really, really simple. So I'm gonna go back into main activity and go into the onCreate method. This is where I want to do the network request. And if you go over here, you can see how, how to create a, a, an object using this library. So it's actually very simple. This is Java code, so I'll translate it into Kotlin code. But all I want to do is um, declare a new instance of the async HTTP client. So I'll say async HTTP client. And now you can see that I get autocomplete because I finished syncing the library. Now it's as simple as saying client.get, and I pass in the URL on which I want to make the request. And you know how I asked that question about COVID and I've been reading some news about COVID recently. So it turns out that there's a really cool nonprofit called the COVID Tracking Project. And they have a really um, nice API where you can get the current data um, of COVID and historical data in the US. So like, for example, um, here's the endpoint v1 slash us slash current dot JSON. And that's what I have open over here. So what, what this says is, you know, like on October 27th, 2020, there are 56 states because they're including some territories like Guam and Puerto Rico, right? Um, but you can basically kind of see here the number of cumulative deaths that have happened, 218,000. And you can also see the Delta from the previous day. So compared to yesterday, there were 73,000 cases of COVID-19 in the US. There were 818 thousand negative cases um, and so on. So basically this is the way we're gonna be able to get data about COVID-19. And I wanna query this and then present it in our application. Is it clear kind of what I'm doing here? Cool. So basically all I wanna do is I wanna copy this URL and then I wanna make a get request on that. And the way this library works is you pass in a, a second parameter here which is um, the callback. So um, I know we're almost out of time. I, basically, like you probably want to have some better error handling. Like you would want to show like a pop up or show a dialogue if the if you hit the on failure. I'm just going to put a log statement here. Log dot e, and I'll say on failure, and I'll also print out the um, the, the throwable. So the throwable, this third parameter indicates what is the issue. And then on success is really what I wanted to talk about. So the third parameter, P2, I should probably just call this JSON. Um, that is what will hold all the data. And so what I can do is I can say log.i um, JSON, JSON like that, right? Let's try this. Also, one thing, a very common mistake here is you don't have the internet permission. So you wanna make sure you go to the Android manifest and add the internet permission. Let's try it. Okay, so I don't see any callback here. I'm not sure why. Um, let me just try this again. Okay, still nothing. Um, <laughs> let me try uninstalling the app. So sometimes what happens is the emulator will just get into a bad state where like it doesn't actually have internet permission. I'm gonna uninstall it and then run it again. If this doesn't work, then I'll finish up, I'll figure out what's wrong and I'll send the code out later just so I don't keep you guys longer. Um, 
Okay, yeah, so still nothing. I'm not getting inside of the on success. Um, did I hit, did, am I hitting the right URL? Oh yeah, that's correct. So then why are we not getting anything back here? Oh yeah, let me debug this. Um, but what I wanted to show <laughs> is basically like, you know, we're able to get back the JSON data here and then you should be able to index into the JSON and like be able to say, hey, you know, like I want the number of deaths or the number of positive cases uh, from the JSON data. And then you can use whatever you, you can do whatever you want with that. You know, you could put it into a recycler view, you could put it into a chart, you could, um, you know, kind of build any application you want based on the COVID data that you're getting back here. Good. Okay, awesome. I appreciate you all joining for today. Um, I'll send out the notes and um, I'll stick around if people have questions. Otherwise, I'll see all of you next week.